How are we on? Good. Welcome to the Better Than Not podcast. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't. But when we at least do something, we know it's almost always better than not. Hi there, and welcome to Better Than Not, the podcast that aims to capture shifting perspectives and thought-provoking ideas in conversation, which is based loosely on my series, A Changing Frame of Reference, which you can read on the Substack app, and I hope you will, as it might give you some insight into what this podcast is all about. I'm your host, Doug Gardham, and today I'm pleased to welcome founder and president of Rock the Bus Productions, which is a new adventure that Mr. Jeremy Cammy is involved with. Jeremy, welcome. Always great to speak with you and great to be here. Love it. I'm, it's, it's very cool for me. I'm very excited about our conversation. I was gonna say, Jeremy, Jeremy and I actually first met a number of years ago. I'm gonna say around the six years kind of time frame. I was out um, in my book, extended book tour, promoting uh, my books, The Actor, The Drive-In and The Musician. And I, I was. The word, let's let you were you weren't promoting. You were hustling. You were hustling. Let, <laughs> That's a good word. That's a good word. I was hustling. Yeah, and I and, met fast authors. I, I you I think you almost I think you've visited almost every store across the country. I it's, I was gonna say it's that's probably pretty accurate. And uh, literally every weekend I was in a store, an Indigo Chapter store or a Barnes and Noble store um, in the Canada or U.S. And so I was looking at ways to further promote it um, on the Canadian side with Indigo Chapters. And I got a hold of Jeremy. He was one of the executives at Indigo at the time. And we, uh, we sat down, had a chat, got to know him a little bit, tried to figure things out. And after that, the pandemic hit. <laughs> and so everything shut down, as we all know. And uh, I was starting to try and figure out what we were doing. I ended up moving out west. But then I saw Jeremy on Clubhouse and I joined one of his meetings and then briefly chatted about a few different things. And then recently I saw him as, I'll call it AKA <laughs> Captain Cammy on Instagram, which prompted me immediately to invite him on to Better Than Not to say, okay, what's, what, what's happening with your, your world? You've, you've been at, a, a, you were years at Indigo as an executive there. You spent a little bit of time, you said, as VP in marketing for Simon & Schuster in the publishing world. And now you're jumping into this whole events kind of uh, arena with the, the, theatrical events and that type of thing. So I'm, I'm really intrigued to know what is, what's happening in your world, but like, how did you even get started with this Captain Cammy? Cause it's really interesting. Well, let's back check first. Thanks for having me on. Uh, oh, you're welcome. I, I appreciate, I know that you say you appreciate my time. Anyone who wants to interview me, I appreciate your time. So thank you. <laughs> And I'm always excited to speak with authors because, uh, and, and Doug, I, I don't know if you were being too generous with your words. Look, I, I try and meet with anyone that needs help or, or hopefully that I could, you know, offer some sort of advice. Uh, but you were a special case in that uh, you. your passionate, truly believed in your product, which I think is at least what I think you're on your third, you're releasing your third novel now. Uh, and And for me, when I, when I spoke with you and met with you, I could tell that we're more alike than not. Uh, because oh, yeah. Passion drives us. Uh, and all you want to do is spread the word and stories connect us. So uh, thank you for the intro. Uh, well, you know, there's a lot going on. I was, I was in the events business with Indigo for uh, over 20 years. Oh, yeah. Loved my time there. Loved everything about it. Uh, there's something about engaging culture lovers and culture makers and somehow connecting yes and if i can on to it then fantastic uh and then you know after that I, though that 20 plus years i thought to myself i i need some time to myself i was out every night hosting oh, events wow. and meeting celebrities and it sounded very glamorous and exciting and it was but at the same time i think the older you get the more me time you need and so I decided, let's jump into the world of publishing instead of retail. And, and I was uh, in the publishing world for a very, very, <laughs> very short period of time. 
and look, risks risks are good. And friends always tell me eyes forward. So I'm not looking back. And from both of those experiences, both Indigo and, and, and publishing, I then decided maybe I want to get back into the entertainment events world sphere, so to speak, but do it at my own pace and run it myself. So it's in its infancy now. Uh, it's called Rock the Bus Productions, which is a pretty cool name because yeah. if I'm not going to, I don't want to give too much away and I don't want to be funny, so to speak, but something big is rolling into town. Uh, yeah. So ho- hopefully first Toronto and then uh, uh, other cities. Uh, we'll talk about global domination at some point <laughs> in the future, <laughs> but, but it's going to be fun. I think it's going to way it's going to change the way uh, uh, people view uh, and seek entertainment. I mean, you can always, you can go see a play, you can go see a concert, uh, you can watch Netflix. This, yeah. I think, is really going to flip everything upside down and it'll be interactive and a great night out for a lot of people. So, rockthebusproductions.com, anyone could sign up and subscribe. And uh, when we're officially ready to, to kick off and launch, so to speak, uh, you'll be on that list. As for Captain Cammy, thank you very yes, much. Yes, I, 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 a lot of people say that because even when you know, even at work, people never called me by my first name. They always called me Cammy or Captain, and I think maybe it's because there's a. I, I've worn this for years, okay. and this is very nautical because it's an anchor, and uh, and uh, it's this is actual rope from a ship. So oh wow, sail. and and I always this reminds me every time of of a captain steering a ship and though mm-hmm. in those in those moments when uh i need to pick me up i you know I, I just sort of play with it or or uh uh rub this anchor over here and i think it's my fidget spinner and sort of my way of getting me back on track or steering the ship in the right direction and i thought to myself if i got this then i might as well just name my my uh, instagram account captain cammy no and that's, that's cool it, so uh, it's, it's all about, like I said, eyes forward, navigating through those storms and coming yep. across clear waters, which no is one. ironic as you and I are literally talking a day after Hurricane Milton. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> which was, was, well, at least from what the news is reporting is the media is some kind of devastating for many of the people in, uh, in the Florida area. So, yes, but, um, but no, it's it's kind of interesting when you say that because you just you just mentioned about getting out for a night of entertainment, and I'm I'm we're big, big movie fans, and we really were hurt over the pandemic because you couldn't go to the movies anymore, right? But it's interesting that um, no one seems out here anyway. Very few people are going to the movies. I'm I'm really kind of shocked. Like uh, unless it's like one of the Marvel big screen superhero movies, we often have the theater to ourselves at Cineplex. So I was going to say, I'm hoping that you're prompt, you're prompting here another kind of evening entertainment that we could get out of our houses to go to. I have not been, I have not paid. I'll say this. So I've been to TIFF obviously in right. the city of, I have not paid to go into a theater uh, since the pandemic. So, wow. What, two, two and a half? I don't yeah. know, maybe two. Uh, it's not that I miss the theater because I am all about the experience. Yes, yes, yes. The, yeah, the beauty of a movie theater is not the movie. The beauty of a movie theater is the theater, the purchase of the ticket, the smell of the popcorn other individuals who are like-minded, who are sitting around you, all having a good time. If they're laughing, you're laughing, et cetera, et cetera. I, I do miss that. What I don't miss, and maybe this goes back, and I'm alluding to you know more of me time, I find that an evening, so to speak, has become almost drawn out. Like you go see a movie. You can't go see a movie and go for dinner. I'll fall asleep. If you ask me for <laughs> if you ask me for a Seven o'clock dinner, then followed by a movie. Like I'm nodding off by ten thirty in the theater. Yes. So maybe this maybe this new form of entertainment, whether it's me or whether it's anybody else, maybe it's it's just snippets or chunks. 
maybe an hour is perfect or an hour yeah, and 50. Yeah. How many times have you walked out of a, not walked out, but during a concert or during a musical, you say to yourself, I wish there was no intermission, just finish it up already. But you can't because you paid the money to go yes. see it. So you have this sense of guilt of, okay, I have to wait for the second act. I got to see the second concert. So I, I think I'm just condensing it. And maybe that's my own personal psyche that I feel like I go see a movie. It's got to be like a four o'clock in the afternoon now because I, I'll, I'll eat and I'll go to bed. I'm not a curmudgeon. I don't want you to think that. But I think life, life has changed for me. It's not like we go out now for five or six hours. It's, it's interesting you say that because we do tend to go to earlier movies. So that might be one of the, it's, I, I mean, I don't mind having the theater to myself, to be quite frank. Yeah. It's like, it's kind of a private showing in a way, but I've just been kind of surprised because I don't really want the movies to go away. And I know many people are saying, well, we got Netflix. And so the streaming at home, we don't have to go out at all. We can just sit at home. But part of the fun to me was actually just going out and getting out there. But to your point, and something about, I'm going to say what you're trying, you've described so far, which I know you're going to talk a lot more about, but with the Rock the Bus is kind of targeting that experience and not making it a marathon. It's like, like a, a segment of time you can go out and feel, enjoy, love the setting that you're, part, part, well, I won't say necessarily participating in, but you're enjoying and then you're done, right? How, how many times and where, where are you now? What city? In, in Abbotsford, which is about an hour out of Vancouver, BC. Well, Abbotsford has the same traffic that Vancouver or Toronto has. Well, so, interesting that you say that because we have the traffic like that, but we have four lanes, not 12. <laughs> so, so, and, you know, we, we could talk about the yes. city's infrastructure for hours on end. Don't get me started. But it's interesting because uh, in this day and age where Everything is in hyperspeed. Yes. You get home from work. You've been invited for dinner. You want to go out. When you're in a city like Toronto, this metropolis, and something starts at 7 or 7.30, you can't possibly get home from work, no. go out for dinner, and then after dinner, you go see a play. It just doesn't work anymore. You can't do that. Oh, and right. by the way, I still have a landline if you could, if you could hear that. Yes, so, I could hear that. <laughs> a few of us still have a landline. Um probably a telemarketer or it could be a movie <laughs> asking me inviting me back in <laughs> totally There's, unrehearsed well hopefully uh, that's what it is <laughs> yeah so i i just feel that the every like the form of entertainment nowadays what the beauty of indigo and the beauty of a book signing was the author speaks for 20 minutes you get to meet the author you press the flesh you shake some hands get your book signed you go it, within 40 minutes you're in and out if there's right. not a huge not a massive celebrity that's, I think, what a lot of us now are used to, is that chunk of time. And yes. they always say, the older you get, the more you want to stay home. Why? Well, you've got to pay your mortgage, so I might as well just stay home. I'm living in this house, <laughs> paying out of rent. I want, I want to get good value out of it. Right. Uh, right. But I, I, I'm just I'm curious to know where, where we go you know, from here. Uh, even if you take a look at, at years and years ago at Hollywood, Look at look at movies that were two hours and twenty minutes, two hours and forty minutes. Then they became then they became an hour thirty. Yeah. Then some became an hour twenty. Like there is a there is a a psychological, and I think it is true that we will watch this. And even when you and I talk, roughly twenty four to forty eight hours, we'll forget fifty percent of this conversation. Oh yeah. And as another day goes, we forget twenty five percent. So at the end of the few days, by Sunday. We will have retained 25% of whatever we spoke about. Same thing probably happens with movies as well. Yes. So might as well shorten them. I, I, think, I think you're on to something there, which is it's kind of interesting. And maybe we'll go through like the pendulum swinging a little bit because we've kind of got into like Scorsese's making three hour movies and Cameron's making three hour movies. So they're like, and you've got to be really in it to be like sit in a chair for three hours. Like I'm, I'm the coffee guy. I get the coffee before the movie. So like I'm, I'm, I'm staying with it, but I sure. think that there's this, this thing now that's coming. And like we talked about, which I want to talk more about is captain cami as well, but Instagram, I mean, you're only seeing things for instance, right? Like very, very short time 
which I think translates into what you're saying to now when we go to longer forms of entertainment, do we really want to be there for four hours? Like we, you know, we, there's only so much capacity in, in our minds, right? The way the brain functions and trust me, I'm not a rocket scientist, brain surgeon. We have been so conditioned the past few years to scroll, uh, even on Instagram or TikTok. The algorithm dictates that you need to get the individual's attention, the viewer's attention, within seven seconds. Yes. If you don't get their attention within seven seconds, you have lost the viewer as they scroll on to another page. Yep. So, yep. so if you take that algorithm and then somehow translate that into life as we know it, think about that. You have seven seconds in order to get our attention or we walk yeah. out the door. So I think, yeah, everything is now condensed into a very short time frame, snippet, sound bite. That's just the way we are in 2024. Yeah, I, I, think, I think your point is like very, very accurate. And I think it also leads to interesting behavior because you'll go to almost any length to capture that seven seconds, right? Like, cause it, you don't even want to, you don't, it doesn't even necessarily have to be accurate. It just, I've got you, I got your seven seconds cause you're listening because of what I just said. Right. Like that's, it's, that's, I mean, I mean for, for some of us, you know, I, I like to consider myself a patient fisherman, so to speak, if I can, you know, use the metaphor, but I have a certain amount of, it's a certain threshold, but even I am guilty of, using these platforms and scrolling and yes. yeah. you know discussion of social media 101 but it is fascinating because it's the younger generation that they they were born with yep. these devices you and i are different like mentioned like i have a landline like yep. the younger generation there's not even an interest in talking on the phone no no message me instead so when they're born with these devices in their hand and they scroll as infants, as children, the attention span that they have, think of our attention span, yep. their attention span has just shrunk completely. Yep. And they so, know, and, they know no different. No, they know no different. And then, and, and, and entertainment nowadays, whether you have it in a physical form or, or a digital form, you need to, you need to adapt to the times. Look at, look at e-reading. E-reading yep. is no different. You know, we were all spending hours on something called a BlackBerry. <laughs> it was a fruit. And look at that. Then, then everyone migrated to an apple. Think yep. about that for a second. We like the fruits. <laughs> but that's right. So we were on these Blackberries, on these devices. Uh, and then somehow we migrated towards Apple. Yep. And then all of a sudden, these digital e-readers came out. And great for travel. Oh, yeah. But as an individual within the publishing industry yes i couldn't bring myself to an e-reader because i spent my whole day on a computer and on a mobile device when i was home at night i want to open the book and again there's an experience doug you know i mean you're an author absolutely so absolutely as a reader reading your book there's an experience of not only touching the pages but smelling the pages and the font there's just something of and yet yeah, there's the the tea the reading socks, the blanket, whether you're in a bath, <laughs> whether you're on a shelf, like it's unbelievable. Yes, it is. Not entertainment. But the beauty of, of a book is that I can close it anytime I want, right? Yep. 20 minutes, a half hour, and then I get back into it when I have the attention span. I, I really under, wonder how that will translate in the future because, I'll, so I'll give you an example, reading an e-reader as an example. Um, I, I like reading them because I can instantly find if I've got a question on a word, I can press the word and I can find out exactly its definition, right? Like that kind of stuff is kind of neat to have. Whereas you go back to a book and that is not possible, right? Like you've got to get up, get a dictionary if you're going to get there or get your phone. And I wonder whether that translates into a different way of, of, of thinking about stuff because it's like, 
I'll hear, oh, I prefer reading a book. But by and large, that demographic is coming from an older side now. It's not an 18-year-old. It's a 45-year-old, as an example, right, or older. And I wonder how that will translate as we kind of move forward. And like you said, the scrolling. Like when you're born with scrolling, you don't know anything different. Like it's it's going to be like like immensely slow, like turtle slow to go to a book, to sit down and literally read words, right? It's uh, and I think I, I, I it's we're I think what I guess this I mean it's a great organic conversation because where we're going is from a place at one point in time, which was, I think, very simple. Yes. Life was simple. And I think life got increasingly more difficult with the advent of computers and devices, which is strange, right? When you think about it, it's a bit of an anomaly. It it's is. It's supposed to make it easier. But the you know, opposite when, has happened. Yes. But when you mentioned about Captain Cammy, I did post, I posted a, a reel uh, a few weeks ago, and, and the reel was very simple. It was basically me saying, Remember the good old days when your friends used to just knock on your door, ask if you want to come outside and play. There was no texting. They didn't phone. They just literally knocked on your door. And if you weren't home, they went to the next door. And it was almost yep. like playing hide and seek until they found someone that wants to come out and play. <laughs> that It would blow my mind today <laughs> if someone came knocking on my door and asked if either of my daughters wanted to yes. go outside and go for a drive or, you know, go for a walk. It just doesn't happen. Nope. And there was a, there was a beauty of that. There was an excitement, yeah. you know, it's dusk. Can I go out? And your parents would tell you, <laughs> yes. yeah, just be home when it gets dark out. Like when the street there, lights come on. It's like, <laughs> there wasn't a worry in the world. And, no. and even then, like that was a form of entertainment. And, and it was, it was real, Jeremy, like that was a, like whether it was a connection, right? Like a human connection as well, right? You found out who your kids were playing with or who they were. And today, like that's almost, I think, kind of absent in many ways or, or, or troubling because that's like, we got to know where you are. So we're going to track you on your phone as an example, right? Which is kind of what I yeah. hear sometimes from parents saying it's the really, that I, what's that? I think. I think the word that I would use is when you're saying that is, is, uh, authentic. So yes. Yes. There was, yes. There was something truly authentic about kids growing up in either the late seventies or in the eighties. And I think that we have lost our authenticity mm. along the way, not to say that we're not authentic. I think that what we are doing, what we create, except even AI, the furthest thing from authentic. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it, it's both to me, like it's very exciting. Oh yeah. Living in 2024 and beyond, hopefully not, oh, not <laughs> but, but I also feel that it's becoming uh, increasingly complicated because of the world around us. So, so it's, it ain't easy. So when you, when you, you mentioned that as like examples that constantly come to me, like one of them is back at that time, you could go into someone else's house and turn their TV on and watch it. You wouldn't dare to try to turn somebody's house. Not that you were even there, but if you went into somebody else's house today, you wouldn't even attempt to turn their TV on as an example, I, which remote I, is it? I, like, <laughs> we, well, yeah. I think you're right. And oh, not even a remote. Maybe it's your voice. Yep. There we go. <laughs> you're, you're totally right. You're bang on. The other thing we found out about moving even out here in different areas is garbage. There's, it doesn't seem like unless you're in the same region, what you recycle, what you compost, what you put in the garbage, the rules are all different. And, and it's like, oh, where I almost have to ask when I'm visiting somebody. Okay. So where does this go? <laughs> like, yeah. You know, I think in BC was, here, for example, yeah. we took us a while to learn this. Um, glass is, doesn't go into recycling. Bottles. Does glass go into glass? Is there no, it goes in the garbage. Why? Well, the, unless unless you're doing something at a separate depot, yes. Um, 
glass does not go in the recycling containers, believe it or not. So what you're saying is municipalities have different ways of yes. determining? Yes. Okay. Because obviously here in Toronto. Yes. Glass goes into recycling. My, my whole life, I mean, that was one of the first ones that went to recycling was glass. And then I yeah. came out, we came out here and I'm going, okay, so, and, and uh, we had to uh, adjust, so to speak, right? I've always found it fascinating. And maybe we should do a study one day. If I have time, maybe I'll sit on the street corner. I've always, <laughs> no, I mean, that's how, because I've yep. actually not done things to this. You walk by in downtown Toronto and you see three garbage cans. One says litter. Yes. One says recycling. Yes. And maybe one says bottles, right? Or cans. Oh my goodness. Yes. I'm curious to know if you were to do a, a psychological assessment, when people are walking at a swift pace, which a lot of people do in huge cities, yes. do they actually deposit the garbage in the right receptacle? Well, I, I hate to say this, but I think we both know the answer. <laughs> but I, but I, this is, um, this is very, this is like, this is like a Malcolm Gladwell type. It is. Essay. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Or, or David Sedaris. Yeah. So I think it, I think it is fascinating because it says a lot about who we are, right? Do it we does. care or are we so self-absorbed? It makes no difference because it's all going to the same place anyways. Well, you, you know what's interesting, because we were just at the airport, just came back, actually just came back from Toronto on the weekend. And at the airport, they have the, the garbage, the, the places for putting your garbage in the airport, right? But it's not words, it's symbols. And I have to kind of look at those symbols, like, to, to figure out, like, where is it supposed to go? Yeah, I, yeah that's, too, that's too much pressure. <laughs> Well, I just, I, all I want to do is throw my garbage out. I just want to get rid of it. And it's Can't like, that. it's so, uh, it's so kind of interesting. But I, Jeremy, I want to go back to what you talked about, about authentic and relational kind of thing about that kind of missing. Because like with AI on, on well, I shouldn't say it's on the brink anymore. It's here. And as we get more into the phone, so what we kind of said earlier on about scrolling, right? Like, this is something we learned as, as a demographic, an older demographic, but the young that like that, they're just growing up with scrolling. It's just like, it's kind of like brushing your teeth even, right? They just, they just know that. How do you see this going with this? Nobody's coming to call on your kids at the door anymore. The, the authenticity is, is fading. What, what do you think is going to happen? Like, how do you see that in the future? Because on the marketing side, it's got some really interesting effects, I would think. Uh, you know, I would love to think or say that there are certain trends ebb and flow. One which I find fascinating is the fashion industry. And I'll answer your question. And you'll understand the method to my madness. There is a massive huge appetite now for thrift shopping. And I'm not suggesting thrift shopping at a discount price. When I say thrift shopping, the kids, I would say, from 12 to 13 through university have a huge appetite for anything from past decades. Clothing. Really? It's a, yeah, it is a, it is a massive, massive, explosive industry now of getting hoodies and sweatshirts with either Rolling Stone or Goonies or Care Bears, like everything that we grew up with, they're now wanting to wear. I say that because I am wondering with, with AI, will, will it peak? And then we go back to a place where we look up in the encyclopedia like we once did, or Will it become a beast of sorts that we literally cannot get away from? It's, it's both, it is dan dangerous, very dangerous, and at the same time, extremely easy. And I'm going to use this term. It's an addiction, and that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. It is dangerous when you no longer have to write an essay or a cover letter or a thank you note. All you need to do is type it into chat GPT. Yes. And within seconds, 
you can copy and paste. That's dangerous. To yeah. simplify your life, bar none, 100% it does. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because um, I went through this example with uh, with our daughter recently where she was putting together a CV and she got all that accumulated and can relate to this in the past. And then you have to write a cover letter. And I said, I don't, I don't know that anyone wants to write a cover letter because it's now you're, you're trying to condense what you already wrote in your CV resume, right? And you've done all the work for that. And she said, well, I, I, I actually put it on chat GPT and, uh, um, and it came out with this beautiful cover letter. And I said, that's so interesting because I said, that's one of those things that you kind of have to have with your CV, right? Like it has to open it. But being a person in the, in the corporate world previously um, you're, and you're hiring, um, I didn't want to really read a cover letter. I wanted to see what was in the CV. And I said, I thought that's kind of a neat application because you have to have one, but not necessarily everyone's going to read it. So now you have an application that you don't have to spend a lot of time creating because your creation is the CV and kind of everybody wins. And that's kind of how I started to think of AI was being an, like an, an assistant versus creating what was like to, you mentioned earlier on our passion for things. I don't think it's going to replace that passion, but if we have to create the, and maybe it'll help us with our PC world. <laughs> but let's no. but let's, let's talk about this. Yes, let's absolutely. Keep, this is a good one. Let's, uh, because I think this is, I think this is very interesting and let's talk about the world. Of work. All right. So cover letters. Do most people read them? You said, I don't really, not interested. And I, I, I don't disagree with you. My understanding based on what I'm reading within the industry and the job market, recruiters will glance or look at your resume. Forget the seven seconds I said before. Yes. The job market, it's two to five seconds. Oh, man. If they, yeah. If they cannot, if your resume does not jump, somehow jump out of the page within two to five seconds, you're automatically put in a no pile. And they're relying but, on the CV, on the cover letter. Now, because... I would say that 90% of companies, if not more, I don't know anyone that would, would take a look through every resume. Now, when you apply for some companies, you have to agree that your resume will be processed through an AI application. And the AI application will scan your resume and forget five to two seconds. That's a computer. It'll take a look at your resume in nanoseconds yeah. and determine whether or not the words that are necessary uh, jump out wow. and then advance you to the next round. So it's not with AI, your resume isn't even being seen by an individual until the final stage when they'll call you for an interview. Whoa. That is scary. Is another form of danger. Well, this... Are you getting the right and, candidate, the qualified candidate? And and your your word authenticity is gone. Oh, you, you yeah, and that, and. You know, you and I have both hired. Uh, your your resume can only tell so much about you. Absolutely, yes. Most organizations hire either for experience or for personality. It is it is rare to find that combination of someone who is perfect yes. for the job, but also perfect for the culture of the company. Right? Yes, yes. Like like my wife always said, and she's right. She says if you if you want a dream. If you want your dream house, you have to build it. Yep. And we all buy houses, and, and, and I understand that. But if you want your dream house, you have to build it. So that translates well into this job market, right? So if you want the ideal candidate, you can build that candidate, or obviously you go through the pool of candidates that are available. Uh, and you have AI on one side, which is filtering out all these candidates. Yep. And then you have aisle left, and then you meet them. And only when you meet them, only when you meet them. Yep. Is that that's that will really give you a strong indication of who they really are. Yep. And for me, when I hire people, I never ask questions that are that, that are standard. Right. I never ask about strengths and weaknesses. 
and <laughs> what you think you bring, what value, et cetera, et cetera. I ask open-ended questions because I want to get to know who they are as an individual. Yes. They're sitting in it. Like, I, I actually want to hire them. They're, I want to hire them. And here's their chance to see if there's a fit. But when you, when you create, when you, when, when AI yep. becomes standard or the block, then you, I think you get the wrong people. Well, I mean, how, how often have you interviewed somebody after seeing their resume and find out that they're completely different from what you thought they were from the resume you read? You know, I've never actually thought about that. I've met, I've interviewed a lot of people and you're right. And you know, you know, I'll tell you what it is. You have two choices in life and you could, you could choose to be kind or choose to be right. I often, choose, <laughs> I, I, good true. one. I like that. And I often, I often choose to be kind. I'll bet. Um, you're taking your time. You've come down. Have there been people where they've walked in and within three minutes, it's not a fit? You know, yes. And to me, it's a disappointment. Not on their end, on my part, because right. I set the bar high. I said, look at this. This is such a great resume. This candidate has everything. Then they walk in and within three minutes, you just it just doesn't you know. click. And that's fine, right? I mean, you know it also. Yep. So you were uh you you worked in corporate for 20 plus years didn't you i did i did yes yeah yeah, yeah. So, so yeah very very aware of it so here's another thing that has kind of occurred to me with this ai world is what's going to stop a company from just using ai to go out and search for what they want through the people out there from the profiles of information they can find on people look that's that's a whole other level of yes, yes, it is. Of uh, it almost reminds me of that that movie, um, which I now forget. But 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 uh, you know, facial recognition, like the whole that that to me is next level. I don't even I wouldn't even be able to understand that. But you're right. Um, like, I just, like, I, like why stop with the AI just figuring reading the resumes? Why not just? I want you to go out and find the person. You have to have the char- the attributes that you're looking for in a person. And I want you to go out there into the ether, the neural network, the whatever, and find those people. And it's like, because everyone has stuff online now, it seems. Look, are we going to get to a, are we going to get to a, a time and a place where you don't even have to look for a person like that? That's scary to me. Oh, it's it, yeah. yeah. So These you're, are... and you're an author, so you understand you understand pen and paper um, and the romance of, of yes, the connection. Book. Yeah. There's a massive connection. Uh, and that's, that's lost with, with AI. And I'm not suggesting that I'm going to go on AI and writing and write the next great novel, but I am sure that I could type in a scenario and it'll spit me out 10 pages. Yep. And, and then it's being, look, that's the issue with Hollywood, right? And part of the strike. Yes. Uh, back in the summer of, yep. of the integration of AI with script writing. It's 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 everywhere now. Well, it's it's interesting because I mean I'm writing this series on Substack now. Um, I read an article every week, and it's kind of about my changing, sh- my shifting perspective on things. And. I don't know, Jeremy, how I would do this 35 years ago, just from the amount of research that's at your fingertips with the internet, right? Like in Googling things, you you for sure have to check your sources. Don't get me like, you can't believe everything that's there. But what you can do in literally hours, like 30 years ago, you would have to be going to the library, like you said earlier, encyclopedias, trying to look up information because you just didn't have a mechanism that allowed you to search for information literally instantly. Do you know, do you know how often I've, I've, I would, I'm sitting on the couch and I'll be eating something and I'll think to myself, can my dog eat that? And I Google it. There you go. What did you do 30 years ago if, if we want to know if our dogs could eat chocolate or grapes? Yep. Did we feed our dogs chocolate and grapes? and dogs them. <laughs> and then oh, it became this urban legend not to feed your your yes. dog grapes or chocolate. But it is true. I was eating eggplant a few days ago. I was like, I've never, I've never really given it red foot eggplant. You think you can eat eggplant? Google it, and there's the answer. Like, I don't know what we did 30 years ago. I don't. 
Well, do you, I, I start to question whether it becomes what we see as intelligence in a person. Like you're at a social, I'll say a social event and somebody, I've used this example a few times, but somebody comes back and tells you kind of crazy, but they, they oh, I, I know the manifest of who was on the Titanic and they recite it to you, right? Like some kind of action like that. They go, wow, you remember that? That's pretty almost forgetting that like I could find the same thing out literally in seconds if I just Google it. So that kind of intelligence that we're impressed by this ability to um, bring things out as we see it today um, is going to become less so because we can all do it and it's going to just get better, right? Like today, I mean, we're typing into our phones or whatever, but the way we get that information will become, we'll be able to get it much quicker um, or almost instantly than we can today. And I often think, will that, will that trigger us looking at intelligence a different way? I'll let's, I'm going to take it back because I'll tell you what I value. Yes. And what I find so fascinating and interesting is this conversation. Yes. That is, that is not pre-rehearsed there are no <laughs> questions sent to either one of us no that's and the fact that we've been speaking now for 40 or 45 minutes without fumbling or pausing that's great that that individual can can, can name off the manifest of titanic yes. yes but can he or she or they also hold a conversation for 10 minutes or 15 minutes that's what i value nowadays i'm a social animal i guess you can see that talk yes. with my hands I'm a social, I'm energetic, uh, I'm an ambivert, meaning that I'm, a, I'm an extrovert when I have to be, but when I'm home, I'm an introvert. Uh, oh. But I value human connection. Yes. And, and we're in a period right now and have been for transition, in transition, of even at work. Yes. Hybrid versus remote versus in office. And this has become a dialect of sorts in every organization of what are we going to do? Yep. How are we going to work? The sales are great. So we can all work remote. I'm a social animal. I believe work is a social system. Yes. I'm not suggesting you have to be at the office five days a week, but I like interacting with people. I like seeing people face to face. I like sitting on someone's desk in the corner of an office yes. and talking and just saying, Hey, how was your weekend? Blah, blah. And within five minutes, We've solved an issue that otherwise would have taken an hour in a meeting. Yes. Yes. So when we talk about technology and AI, I almost feel like this conversation is going full circle. Yes. Where we have to get to a place where someone knocks on our door again and says, do you want to come outside and play? It'll, it'll be so interesting to see how that kind of comes come through. Because as soon as you say about knocking on the door, I immediately, because I grew up with road hockey and like expressions like car. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And you say that today and people kind of look like, at, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah you, got but, to, you get to drag the net to the side of the street. Totally. <laughs> yeah. And, and some of those conventions. And, I, and like I said, I think there's a, like, there's a mark that technology enables us to do a lot of things. But you had said this before, that it was, and it's, it's almost ironic because it was sold on the basis of giving us, uh, freeing up our time. And it's actually done the opposite. Like it's, it's, it's like, it's all consuming. Yes. Yes. And, yeah. and I, I think, I, I think I heard this from uh, Jordan Peterson, but he said that in our brain, there's something that what motivates us to eat and drink that we like, we have to do that to live. The same thing is we have that same hunger for information. So that like, there's almost no end to it, right? Like, this is one of the things that I often think about is that it's, you get interested in like, I'll say kind of different philosophies, different things that you historical, I just, this is all part of my shifting change frame of reference. And even though I'll know, I'll never know everything. It's not like I just hang up my coat and give up. It's like, I have thirst for it more than ever. Like well, it's. I have I have a constant thirst for knowledge, just like you just you said. 
you can have a constant thirst for knowledge without being all consuming or addicted or addicting. Yes. So yes. I yes. Have to find the happy balance of removing yourself from the platform and at some point saying enough is enough. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, like I, I said to you minutes ago, let's go out and see where people place their garbage. Yes. Okay. Different. Doug, Doug, let's do a different study. Let's, let's, let's go out downtown and watch people on the street. How many of them are taking in the sights and sounds and senses of life versus how many of them are looking down at their devices? Yes. It's so staggering. I guarantee you that more than 50%. Oh yeah are completely immersed in Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is on their phone yep. while they're watching. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's it, it, that, that to me is one of those, those things that's just taken over that. Yeah. Um, you, and that you, is the, 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 and I'll, I'll keep using the word romance or, or others, but, or beauty, the beauty of the bookstore that you're so familiar with, the beauty of the book within a bookstore, it creates a sense of community where you walk in and you realize that everyone who likes books are just nice people. So your book people are nice people, right? So you walk into a bookstore and it's as if you're leaving the rest of the world behind. You're, and and my, this is just not a bookstore. We could say yeah. libraries in general, yeah. right? You're walking in and there's just something about it where it takes you to different worlds without even having to travel and you're talking to like-minded people and you don't have to be on your device. Yep. That's life. And that's where I think we should be going. We were there. It stopped and we got to get back to where we once were. We probably have to go to a point where we get individually realizing how much we need that. And until we do, we won't switch it. Like I think some of the things I've written about is like, we're talking about a large epidemic of loneliness today with, with people um, post pandemic, getting used to being in your house. It's comfortable. It's a risk to go out the door. I think Frodo said that right. In Lord of the Rings, you know, it's kind of risky to step outside the door. But every time you go out and have a coffee with someone or you go out and see someone and say hello to something, there's some, there's an energy that kind of happens that you can't get being alone by yourself in the house. And I think that the devices and technology do nothing to help us do that. They keep us in the house, right? They, like whether it's we're, we're watching a screen on our computer, watching a, a, a streaming screen, whatever it is, it keeps us there. And I think... We have to get that, I'll say almost, we have to get sick in order to recognize how much we need each other and how much we need people. I, I, caught, I got used to this, because I, I found it out because when I switched out of the corporate world where all day long you're having meetings, right, with different people, and you're kind of going, oh man, if I could just have a rest here. But then it switched so that I'm spending a lot of time alone working with writing and things like that. And it became a very apparent to me is I have to get out to see people. Like I just, I can't function in a healthy way to your point without someone either knocking on my door to invite me out to play or being the one that initiates that and going to someone else's house. I'm using that as a metaphor, but that's kind of what, Pick up the phone, phone somebody and go for a coffee. And I can't, I, it's, it's made an enormous difference in my life post pandemic because I, I wasn't quite so aware of it. I got, I'll share a story with you that I think we all uh, are probably already aware of, but you take this hat as an example. This is, this is the old Montreal. Yes. yes. Yeah. This team has been defunct since they moved to Washington back in the early 2000s. When I wear this hat out, more often than not, either in Toronto or I was in Italy this past summer, I will get people coming up to me, talking to me about this logo and the fact that they remember the Montreal Expos. Cool. When you talk about or mention that you like to get out and talk with people, I actually want to believe in the best of people 
and I actually believe that people want to engage. Oh, wow. Now, if it's on an elevator or an airplane, okay, I get it. Confined spaces, you can't really escape. Totally understand. But two like-minded people who see each other on the street and are both wearing the same team hat. Oh, my or goodness. Rivalry team hats. That strikes up a chord. And most of the time, they will speak to each other and say, did you see that game last night? What would you think? We Absolutely. beat you. And, and although it's tongue-in-cheek, we want to engage. Yes, yes, for sure. And, and whether it's for a minute or whether it's for five minutes, I think that that in and of itself charges our battery, right? Oh, you got and, it. Yeah, and, and I'm feeling that it's funny that we're talking about you know tech and experience and authenticity. Yes. I think that we almost collectively we need a reboot. All of us we need yes. a, we need a full reboot where we get back to the fundamentals of social interaction, social grace, what matters most. Yep. And and realizing at some point that hey, we're only here for a very small period of time. Oh. So let's make the best of it with each other. It's it's amazing you bring that up because with the 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 hats, um, my my son, I I introduced him a, a few years ago to uh, well they're not around anymore, but the band Rush. I'm a big Rush okay. fan. I hosted Getty Lee on many occasions. Oh, oh, for his uh, new book. Well, oh, first my... well, the book, the one that we was he he had a book about guitars, which yes, I found yes, back. the big bass yeah. book. Yes, I, yeah. I'm a fan. I have those books, and yeah, he's uh, he's great. So we were at at uh, Molson Amphitheater, and we were sitting there. And my son looks over at me, and he goes, "This is where you learn so much from your kids." And he goes, "What's it like, Dad, to know that you could sit with almost anybody of this eighteen thousand people crowd, and you could talk about Rush with them for four hours?" <laughs> and it's like one of those kind of it's exactly the same thing. Someone else sees this Montreal Expo; they have a connection, and we talk, and right. And it's very true from a, a Rush fan perspective. You meet someone else that knows Rush, just like you said. You, you already knew two of Getty's books, right? Or yeah. I like this. I saw them in Detroit or whatever it is. And those connections is that almost that authenticity that you talk about that you I, I don't think you can get outside of being kind of face to face. Like, and I, and, I will. And I think I think that's a fascinating point. And I'll go even further with you that. When you're on vacation, hmm. I would never in my wildest dreams in the city of Toronto, just walk up to someone and say, Hey, what book are you reading? I might get punched in the face. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're all on vacation and we see someone lying in the sun with a book that we'll go up to them and we'll say, how's the book? Is it good? Should I get it? Yes. They will stop everything they're doing and tell you all about the book. They may ruin it. They may, <laughs> there may be spoilers, but they are happy to tell you about the book. Yep. And it's no different than when you're at a gathering and people say, what are you watching on Netflix? And oh, what are we watching on Netflix? Wait for this series, I have to tell you. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the engagement that I like. That's the engagement that I thrive on. Like oh, I, yeah. And I've realized, and again, I'm, I, don't, I didn't major in psychology, but there, there, there must be a reason as to why we, human nature, we humans were we're wired that when someone asks us something that oh. means so much to us, we just can't wait. We're exploding because we want to tell them. Yes. Oh, you're going, you're going to Italy. Oh, you have to try this restaurant, right? Yep. I mean, yep. going to Vancouver, you, you have to go, you got to go here for skiing. And then it, it's all just becomes where to eat. Where should we sleep? This is the hotel we stayed at. It's amazing to me. I, 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 that connection to me, is what I really started to begin to notice that like I need, like I thrive like, cause you come back from having that coffee with a person. You may not even know them all well. It's kind of a, a, a way of having a chat, but I'm enthused, right? And I've found the same comes from doing better than not as well. Like these conversations, right? I wouldn't have believed without having like a person in the room to be able to, but the visual and the voice really connects us in a way to have that conversation to what you said earlier on that's not pre-planned like it's 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 real it's this is what's coming to mind yeah and i and i um you know you can you can know a little 
this is this is very you can know a little about a lot or a lot about a little. And if you know a little about a lot, you can talk to almost anyone. It, it's fun. It, it really is fun. So yeah. when we <laughs> go back like what we started with when your captain Cammy. So what was like something had to like be the catalyst to get you started with that on Instagram? Like Okay, that's great, great point. I um so I danced every Friday on Instagram for probably through the pandemic also. Uh, you know, I, I had to stop a few a few months ago or a year ago only because I'm getting older. But but um it's interesting because what really blew it up, and I'll, I'll tell you what blew it up because I remember I was hiring a uh an events manager. Okay. And and uh this was about I would say this was two thousand 16, 15, 16. Oh, uh, a while ago. Yeah. And we were getting resumes. Uh, HR was obviously going through them and vetting them. And I thought to myself, you know what? This is a great culture within Indigo. People should be able to see how great this culture is. So I asked one of my colleagues to film me dancing on my desk. And I think it was nine to five or taking care of business. <laughs> <laughs> perfect songs right yep and yep. basically it was me dancing and saying apply because if you apply this is who you get to work with right oh wow <laughs> so we were flooded with resumes I'll and bet. also the views were through the roof oh man I, uh, man this resonates w why is it because i'm sort of clumsy but i can dance or is it because it's different and unique and not other people are doing this? Oh, yeah. And so it became a thing every single Friday that I would dance in the office and I'd pull a different colleague uh, and they, they would dance with me. And that lasted for, you know, five or six years. And, and through that, Instagram for me became a vessel yes. where I could be the architect of brighter days. And I could somehow, in some small way, make at least one person smile. And yes. if, I, if I do that, then I've done my job. So that's where, that's where it was. And, you know, sort of that's where it's migrated to, where, you know, every day or multiple times a day, I'm either posting on happy news or my own thoughts, sometimes serious, oftentimes not, getting a laugh out of it. Yeah. And if I could... And if I could change the world by doing that in some really, really small way, and as you mentioned, there's someone, and we're all battling loneliness, if I manage to crack a smile <laughs> somewhere in someone's house by themselves, then then that's great. So, you know, why stop? I mean, I'm sure there'll be a point where I get too tired, but right, <laughs> right now I'm enjoying it and I love the comments. And, and, it, and it helps me connect with people that I've never even met before. <laughs> I was going to say, because I, I know... Yeah, I saw one today. It was with a dog in the water. Oh my god! That so that exploded. That I posted this morning. So the backstory of that was that Hurricane Milton. That that was the yeah, hurricane yesterday. Yes. In town, the the state troopers found a dog that was tied to a fence on the side of a highway. So their thinking is that the owner basically abandoned the dog. Ah, so, so you're right. It was actually tongue in cheek because I started off by saying what a horrible thing to do. And then I, I spliced Liam Neeson into the video from his famous speech from Taken, where he <laughs> talked about, about a specific set of skills and he's going to be a nightmare for that person. So I fused that together. Oh, got cool. a good and it was going pretty well. And then somehow in the afternoon, I got a notification that says you're real has over a hundred thousand views no way so somehow forget the algorithm i don't know what's going to connect one day it could be yes. a dance one day it's about me talking about a dog that's drowning in a flood like you just don't know no. what where you're gonna land right yep. You, you, yep. you you throw the ball or or you're, you're kicking the field goal and you <laughs> hope it goes close or or you're waiting or you're waiting for that home run yep regardless what it is that just landed that connected and i can't tell you why maybe it's because 
people are dog lovers or animal lovers and they don't want to see them tied up. Whatever the case, that's great. And so I hope I made someone's day and tomorrow it'll be something else. I, I'm glad you I'm glad you talked about that because it's, it was kind of like I was trying to figure out like and I, I well, you, you said like, I think I maybe spent I don't think I hit seven seconds because <laughs> I knew we were going to be talking today. So I said, okay, I, I won't find out about this because Jeremy will tell me. And I'm kind of going like, but was the dog there? Cause they thought the dog would blow away. Like that was kind of what I was thinking. Like they done something like that, but that's a much, a much better story to me. And I love uh, the Liam Nielsen speech. That yeah. is so yeah, cool. great. <laughs> very, very cool. So, now I go on to your new, this new Rock the Bus. I love the title. I love the name. Thank you. With your background, it's like, it, it's almost like, okay, this is going to come. But what prompted you to like, I want to do something different than what's out there today? Like, I want to, I like, I like stirring the pot and it's a bit of a risk also. Uh, yep. uh, but at the same time, you know, it could be very rewarding. Uh, what I'm seeing out there and what I'm learning is that, and I've known this for a long time because I programmed music for all Indigo stores for many years, that music is a connector and oh, has yeah. been, like, just like books are a connector. Yep. And just like you talked about Rush and yep. going to the con. Music is a connector. And there's a lot going on today within the music biz. You just, if you look at even Taylor Swift alone oh, and what, yes. what she has done for this industry. And I believe that if you gather a group of like-minded people in one room and you put on a song and you see them all singing, yes, that, what I, that is called adding joy to the <laughs> moment right? because moments matter. Right. And I fully believe. So when we talk about rock the bus, you can pay for inanimate objects, right? I could, I could buy myself a watch. Yep. I could buy another bracelet. What I've noticed, not slowly, but over the past few years, is that people want to buy moments. Yeah. And, yeah. Moment, and moments are valued. And yep. then you take that moment, you bring it home, and you put it in a drawer, so to speak. Yes, yes. Then in Years from now, you open that drawer and you remember it. And that's no different than, you know, when I hosted Bruce Springsteen back in, in okay. 2018, people still talk, will see me today and talk about how, <laughs> what a life experience that was um, for them, that moment. Yeah. And so trying to do with, with Rock the Bus, and again, in its infancy, but soon, what I'm trying to do is to create that moment that is different and unique, that doesn't yet exist within the entertainment industry i mean take a look at what the las vegas sphere has done yes right? yes oh my goodness and like so that in and of itself has taken the concert experience to, to another level a level imax level right uh so what i hope to do with this is to take the music experience to a different level where you have like-minded people who are just enjoying each other's company and so entranced with the moment yep. that um, that when they leave or when they get off the bus, so to speak, that they'll remember it and they'll say to themselves, "That was unbelievable." Yeah. We need to have more of that. And so that's what I'm what I'm trying to bring to this city, and and hopefully at some point in the future, other cities. I mean, it's it's if if you take a look at at Take a look at, at, at hop on and hop off, off, off buses or in, in any city, right? Tour buses. Yeah. The individual once thought of many years ago, there's tourists in our town. We, they should all get on a bus and we'll show them different landmarks and sites. Great yep. idea. Right? Yeah. Billion dollar industry. Like someone thought of that because yep. it didn't always exist, but someone thought of that. So I think this is separate. It's different. Not showing landmarks. Nope. But offering a form of, of entertainment that, that will add value. So all yep. these buzzwords that you and I have been speaking about, authenticity and moments, <laughs> et cetera, adding value to me yeah. is also not value for your money. That's not what I'm talking about. Right, right, actually, right. Actually, you mentioned 
an hour ago that you still go to the movie. Yes. Right? Yes. Does yes. It add value. Yeah. And that's what I do. I want to add yeah. value to people's lives. And whether it's through Instagram and it's that smile I'm getting yeah. as an architect of brighter days, or whether it's through Rock the Bus, it's adding value, adding joy, being authentic, uh, and doing it in a way that people will think that their time wasn't wasted. Yep. It was valued. It's, it's interesting, Jeremy, when you talk, because I, I think what you're, tr what you're capturing is being present or being in the Great present. Term. Great term. Because I think that, I'll say the last few generations, we spent a lot of time thinking about the future, like, and worrying about the future and what's going to happen. And I mean, the last couple of years, that's, that's not painting a great picture by and large, but to be in the present to me yeah. is just like, and, and, and you hit the music word, right? Music really does make us present. Like there's something about the feeling that's real. And if in capturing that in a theoretical, in a, a theatrical kind of event, there's something that like, I'm, I'm here, I'm present, I'm in the now, I'm living this very moment. It's, Think of how many, how many times you've gone to, the, to a concert. Okay, you were at that Rush concert. Were you fully present? Oh. Or, or were you recording on your phone, right? Well, so that's, yep. Yeah. No. You'll pay dollars to go to a concert and then yeah. end up recording the whole concert on your phone until at some point, sometimes the artist will say, Everybody, let's put down our phones for five minutes right. and just enjoy. That's when you talk about being in the moment and being present. Absolutely. We can't. We can't. And you and you can't like. I mean, I'd be willing to bet that a very very small percentage of those recordings of people with their phones are ever watched again. No, never. It's it's. I think it's. I think it's. I think it's. It's it's in the vault, right? If, but, if anything, it's shown to say, "Look at me and where I was." It's not it's even a, about that moment that you're trying to capture with uh, with Rock the Bus. To me, it's, it's an like insurance policy, so that when someone says you weren't really there, yes. you can say, "Oh, please, <laughs> I'll send you the video." But that's what it is. And it's it's just because I mean, you'll see concert shots, like, and like, it's just stunning. Like the whole audience has their phones up. Yeah, like yeah. It, to me, it's just overwhelming. Like I just, it's hard to believe that it's like that. And it's like, there, there's something about being in the present that we can't capture any other way. I think I read something in Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis that said, it's like connecting with eternity, like, because it's that instant that's instant, but that's forever too, if you know yeah. what I mean. Like, I'm curious to know, you know, your listeners, um, once they hear this, it would be interesting to know the last time they had a conversation with someone that lasted over an hour. Like, <laughs> no, but I, but I right. mean, but I mean, right. when's the last time two people just sat and spoke for an hour, just about a variety of topics? You know, you know, when you bring that up, this brings me up to another thing that um, I'll say is kind of close to home, but I won't, I won't go too far with that. But it's, it's the idea we're kind of in a society that is, um, is an exchange society. And if I do this, I'll get this as an example, right? And I think it falls into the conversation part in that if I can't deliver something, and this is a conversation, right? That's what this is about, which we're trying to capture in a spontaneous way. If I can't give something to someone else of value, I don't know that I'm worth anything to participate in that. And I sometimes wonder whether... This is part of the struggle in people coming together. Like I've said before, if I, uh, if I probably didn't pick up the phone and call somebody to go out for coffee, my phone might not ring, if you know what I mean. Like someone has to be the catalyst. Someone has to get it started. And I'm intrigued that possibly because our society is so connected with earning or I give you this to get that, this exchange that happens, that if we don't feel we have anything to exchange, we don't want to have that conversation. And I, and I don't, and I, I sometimes think 
ah, how did we get here for that particular reason? Because that is the community. That is part of the being, well, even the present part, so to speak. But to your, to your point, um, <laughs> I guess there's not a lot of conversations to go for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> But I was going to say, this is one of these things that I just, I think this long form conversation is a really interesting thing that, and we'll go back to books because, um, go back to reading. Um, everyone can't necessarily read or sit down, but everyone can listen if they have ears, right? Like they, they can listen to a podcast. They can listen to a conversation that... If, Maybe if they're not were, happening, but there's something in listening to uh, two other humans having a conversation that means something. If you were to assess on an Excel spreadsheet our distribution skills and the percentage of each, 45% of what we do on a daily basis is listen. 45%. We don't, it's not talking. It's 45%. Then 30% is listening. Then 16% is reading. And then 9% is writing. And if my math is correct... That's 100%. Yeah. Yep. And yep. it is. The, but the 45%, when you think about it, that's the most critical. And whether we're hearing or listening, yes. are two very different. Oh, two very different. Good point. But the fact that we spend the majority of our time listening, that says a lot about who we are as individuals and the connections that we want to make. Mm -hmm. And I feel that when you think about that, that 45%, this goes back to the beginning of our conversation with the endless scrolling that we're doing and visual, right? So now we're both using the ears, the auditory, and the visual, and I think it becomes sensory overload that for us is a bit of dopamine, which is why, <laughs> which is why we right. continue to scroll. Yes. And this long-form conversation... Maybe in the end, there was a method to your madness that you're hosting all these podcasts, which makes perfect sense that you're trying to get to a place whereby there's a human connection. Yes. Yep. Rather than the thumbing of back and forth or up and down. And, and, and it's, it's an interaction. So I think that that part is, is kind of a, an interesting thing. But I also find that Something I, I didn't know, but I think might be in all of us, is that uh, it's fun to have a chat about something that you didn't plan to have a chat about. <laughs> Look, I, 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 I've been, you know, I've been, in, I've been in, the, in, in publishing for 25 years. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have been blessed to both be on the receiving end and host. And I've been on the other end where I've actually interviewed. Um, Every interview that I have done, and I've done hundreds of interviews, you know, Dolly Parton and, and Hillary Clinton, oh. and the list. But what I've learned from these interviews is that no good comes out of anything that's pre-rehearsed. No good at all. There is, and again, Amazing. this authenticity. For the very few individuals or authors or celebrities that, that ask for the questions in advance, okay, fine, we'll give it to them and they can bet it. But for the most part, the best conversations are the ones that are natural. And I never knew this until recently, but apparently late night talk shows are all predetermined. When, you, when, when the guest comes out onto the stage, it's not as organic as we think it is. Yes, yeah. They know the questions that, that the late night host is going to ask. They, the, the publicist has vetted the questions, et cetera, et cetera. So it's fascinating, even in, the, in that industry. I mean, is Hollywood real? Is Hollywood fake? That's a whole other. <laughs> but even that is interesting, and uh, yeah. and how they can somehow make it look as if it's completely authentic. Yes, it's. I mean, the... I mean, that's their. I think that's the talent, right? That yeah, that they have to right. do. But yeah. I I know um, in what uh, began to appeal to me. Not that I had any idea that I'd be actually doing it, but when I first started to watch Rogan and Joe Rogan and the the fact that he would have some interesting guests on and to your point i can remember like back in the day when they would talk about seinfeld going on carson or they would talk about short and they all had to do their bits whether it's letterman they're going on they'd rehearse it because this this was time for the show themselves we're watching as a viewer going 
well, now I know Jerry Seinfeld. And you kind of go like in that five minute bit, it was all pre-rehearsed. Like you said, it's all been part of the show. So you're getting a sense that you know who this is, which is actually not who they are at all, by and large. It's their, <laughs> their persona, stage persona. And what I started to realize is that after, like on the Rogan, like you, you can have an actor on or whoever, a comedian, and you can have them talking for 10 or 15 minutes. They can be on for that length of time, like as far as their persona. But after you get into half an hour, an hour, or hour and a half, the real person has to start coming out eventually. <laughs> you, you would think. You, you, like that's to me, like they, you, you just get wore down to, okay, this is me. Like, and you may not even, even know that. And that's why I said I like this long form because I get to find out all kinds of things that I would not normally kind of get to learn and enjoy. Look, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, that every, everyone has a story. Yes. Everyone, everyone has a story. You and, got that. And I think that, that what in the years that we've known each other, we have learned more about each other in, in this hour than we have <laughs> any email or any conversation or sit down. Absolutely. So, I think this is a great, this is a, this is, this acts not only as a podcast, but a lesson for others. Oh, uh, yes. Sit down, ask questions, learn about each other. Have fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was going to say, this is, this is a good place. I think um, I'll, I, I'd love to do this again, um, but do you want to do anything to promote the, the um, rock the bus productions as far as that go? I mean, obviously we'll, we Captain Cammy. I hope people will tune into your stories because they're, they, they are pretty, they will make you think. Instagram it's captain underscore Cammy C A W M Y. And uh, as for rock the bus, uh, www.rockthebusproductions.com. There's a subscribe button, enter your email. And uh, when we're ready and we're ready to launch this thing, which is hopefully imminently, uh, we'll add you to the list and then you can unsubscribe, hopefully not, but <laughs> you still, at least you'll get the initial um, uh, feel for the brand and what we're trying to bring to this city and hopefully a lot of cities across the country. Um, cool. So thanks for the thanks for the uh, thanks for the uh, the pitch, so to speak. I, I, I wish you all the best with this idea of uh, this the theoretic this theatrical event that you're putting together because I, I was going to say anything that can get us to me in the present to, to enjoy that and connect with that I think is very very cool Jeremy I can't thank you enough for joining us here today um, better than not I hope you'll tune in I hope you've all enjoyed what uh, Jeremy has had to share with us today we'll put in the uh, description Jeremy the the your WW for uh, rock the bus <laughs> Great. And uh, give a little bit more promotion. If you could stay on for just a minute after we say goodbye, that'd be appreciated. And uh, again, thank you for tuning in to Better Than Not. And uh, we'll see you again. Bye. Thank you. Are we on? Good. Welcome to the Better Than Not podcast. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't. But when we at least do something, we know it's almost always better than nothing.